Hello, my name is Rosalind Price Cousins. I am one of the business skills coordinators here at the Crafts Council. And I'm here today with Melanie Eddy, who is a jewellery designer and maker with 23 years of experience. And she is going to be talking to us about her um, setting up and running her craft business. So I think that will be really insightful for everybody. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Melanie now and she'll take you through some slides. And at the end, we'll have a bit of a chance for some questions and answers. And I'll join you again then, Melanie. Okay. Hello. So just chatting that way. <laughs> there we go, now my slide's working. So I'm Melanie Eddy and I'm a jewelry designer and maker. I make sculptural jewelry that uses geometry as a tool to explore the relationship of form to the body. There's a couple more examples in the pieces. Um, it's made by hand here in my studio, uh, which <laughs> behind me and around me, um, and either by working directly with, um, uh, with the metal, um, or hand fabricating piece or working um, by carving pieces by wax um, and then casting the wax models into precious metals. So I work in silver, white, yellow, and rose gold and platinum. Once pieces are cast into metal, there are a variety of processes that are undertaken by hand before a finished piece leaves the studio. I work across the spectrum, bringing some form and dynamicism to everyday wearable pieces, but also working at scale on more ambitious sculptural forms that envelop the body. So I've been working in some capacity in jewelry for 23 years and have had my own jewelry business for 12 years. Outside of studio spaces that I've borrowed when I didn't have my own, this, this studio that I'm in currently is the second studio um, that I've had to myself. And um, well, to myself in terms of like a proper studio, but um, I currently share this space with one other full-time uh, maker, um, as well as a new mom who has scaled back her practice, but is still making jewelry when she can. So much of my work is informed by our relationship to architecture, uh, both how we inhabit architectural spaces and how they transform our environments, both in urban landscapes and rural landscapes, but also because I have a particular focus on how geometry um, is used to define the spaces around us. Um, and in particular, how it's used in the creation of sacred spaces um, and how that geometry kind of works to help foster a sense of solace, peace and kind of spiritual experience. Um, in addition to the more practical functions of a building that has to house uh, congregation and service the community. So um, this focus stems from my interest in the function of jewelry beyond adornment. And so my pieces work towards creating experiences for the wearer and viewer in regards to how we engage and respond to sculptural forms on the body. I've always enjoyed being part of a community of makers. And over the years, this has formalized into engagement with organizations um, to foster these connections. Um, one of these is the Association for Contemporary Jewelry of which I'm a director. Um, and for me, the relationships I have with other makers and with others in the industry that are part of the process of making are really important to me. Uh, many people um, were kind to me on my journey um, with my jewelry practice and shared information and imparted their knowledge. Um, and that was really invaluable to me. So I'm always open to doing the same for other makers. Uh, there's a few other organizations that I'm also kind of involved with. Um, one is the Pan-African Jewelers Association, and there's two groups in the US that I have connection with, the Women's Jewelry Association, uh, three, three actually, the Women's Jewelry Association, Black and Jewelry Coalition, and the BIPOC uh, Jewelry Designers Group. So when creating pieces, I'm looking at how they will fit into the lifestyle of the owner of the piece. What, they, what, they, what do they need from their jewelry? Where do they want it to be on the body? And how do they want to wear it? How do they want wearing a piece of jewelry to make them feel or be seen? So 
So the core of my jewelry practice now is predominantly bespoke gem set gold jewelry in my signature faceted style. I also have a limited amount of pieces, both gem set um, and gold and silver sculptural pieces that are for media sale directly from me uh, or that are shown in small groups at galleries um, or other retail kind of locations throughout the UK for short periods of time annually. So initially, much of my business came through showing at selling events like craft fairs and galleries, um, which then that kind of was a schedule of events that ran throughout the year. And with time, I was getting more and more business uh, through people seeing my jewelry worn uh, by colleagues, friends, family members. Um, and they were reaching out to get in touch with me for their own pieces um, to buy or to order or to commission pieces of gifts or for, uh, to mark special events or um, for special occasions. So my business, um, kind of expanded in that way. And it also expanded as people became more adventurous in their choices for engagement and, and uh, wedding rings. So there's actually um, the, pitch, the pieces that are pictured on this slide are actually um, wedding and engagement kind of uh, rings just to show some different examples of, of, of how I kind of do pieces for that particular kind of function. So yeah, so as I said, they began to move away from kind of traditional jewelry forms and considered more contemporary jewelry um, for these kinds of pieces. So now because of this, um, so now for several years, I've consistently had commissions on the go like throughout the, the whole year. And as my profile has raised and with the growth of engagement on social media, a lot of my sales come from people seeing my piece or pieces featured in editor editorial or via Instagram and Facebook. So I don't yet have a direct selling platform via my website. I'm working on a new e-commerce website at the moment, um, but the bulk of my sales are still essentially um, online sales from people connecting with me via email or um, through the messaging functions on Instagram or Facebook. So I've built up quite a large offering of different kinds of objects as new pieces were designed and made over the years. So with a large amount of variations of earrings and rings, which are my best sellers and smaller amounts of neck pieces, necklaces, brooches, couplings, bracelets, and bangles. So I then um, had like a smaller group of gem set pieces. So predominantly gold rings um, with some earrings and pendants available and a smaller offer of larger sculptural gem set silver uh, rings and necklaces. So now I'm kind of curating um, what I have for immediate sale. So what's available like for people to buy from me directly or if I'm showing somewhere um, from this wider kind of range and group. And I'm looking to focus predominantly on my gold sculptural pieces, both with and without gemstones and larger sculptural um, silver pieces. I've got kind of one of the rings here. So I will still carry a selection of smaller gold pieces that will be accessible as everyday pieces, um, kind of small stud earrings. Um, uh, but I wanted to curate my offering to keep the sculptural qualities at the forefront of what I'm doing and, and how people see my work and to give actually also to give some space to develop some new work to push, push my practice forward. Another thing that has developed um, out of my jewelry practice over the years has been um, quite a lot of wider work around, around my craft practice and within my industry. So I think it's really interesting that as makers, um, many of our skills can be transferable and can generate income to support our creative practices. And for me, um, by being pretty open and enthusiastic about other kinds of opportunities, that were surrounding my craft, a really interesting and engaging portfolio career has developed kind of over the years, like within the jewelry industry. So I've been teaching for over 13 years now, both here in the UK and internationally. Um, there's a photo of me um, when I was doing some teaching um, at a art and uh, art um, institute in Afghanistan, in Kabul. Um, 
so, but this has always been in a fractional capacity. So it's never been like full time. It's always been around uh, my practice. Um, and so I, I, I've taught as an associate lecturer um, at Central St. Martin's and University of the Creative Arts. I've given lectures um, at other um, higher education uh, uh, in, um, universities and, and places, and also given short courses and workshops, um, both kind of at um, like college level, university level, but also through community-based uh, programs. And this, this has also led to wider kind of um, sector development work, uh, writing, speaking engagements, um, I've also been involved in exhibition installation and curation. So I've got an example here of um, uh, uh, an exhibition I curated, which I'll talk a bit about later. So gem and also um, some work I did with the v &A. So um, I basically um, was invited to uh, work um, twice with the Victoria and Albert Museum. First was the first time was installing jewelry in their William and Jewel, Judith Bollinger Jewelry Gallery. So in 2008, when they were completely redesigning uh, and reinstalling the gallery, and then again in 2013 for their pearls exhibition. Um, I also got to run a really awesome workshop at the National Gallery called Painting Jewels, Capturing the Light, and that was a three day exploration and introduction um, into the art of jewelry rendering. And that was held at the National Gallery. So um, the the ex I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Gem. So Gem basically um, came out of a really interesting period of of work that I did for about six years, where I was working with um, craft communities uh, within Afghanistan and Pakistan, Pakistan um, jewelers and gem cutters, um, and that also kind of ended up. Uh, going more widely into some work in India um, with actually with Afghan um, jewelers and gem cutters on some training initiatives and a speaking engagement, which took me all the way to Thailand. So, but the gem exhibition was a real highlight and that was basically um, an exhibition of contemporary jewelry and gemstones from Afghanistan, which showed in uh, London and Edinburgh in 2013 and 2014. And it was a collaborative um, touring exhibition uh, between the British Council and Turquoise Mountain, which is the art institution, which I did a lot of work with in Afghanistan. Um, and it was exploring the processes and traditions behind gem cutting and jewelry making in Afghanistan and how these techniques could be applied to contemporary practice. Um, and we worked with local and international craft, crafts, uh, men and women, uh, designers and artisans um, as part of this exhibition. Some films were commissioned as well. Furniture was commissioned to showcase um, the artifacts that we had there. Uh, gemstones were loaned to show the breadth of um, the different kinds of gemstones that were available in the country. Um, and it really kind of was great because it showed a different side of, of that region than most people see uh, in the news and they read about. But it also brought to life a lot of personal stories of jewelry makers and gem cutters um, in Afghanistan. And it kind of explored how um, kind of crafts, arts and culture can contribute to rebuilding um, a country um, kind of in terms of post-conflict um, situation. So the thing that's been really great about this wider work is that it's allowed me um, to be very focused with my actual jewelry practice and all the work kind of ties into jewelry and it feeds back into my practice and the development of my work. And it allowed me to become connected with lots of individuals um, that are also making and designing contemporary jewelry, but also people that were kind of championing, championing, championing <laughs> the work, uh, craft and jewelry um, at various stages of their careers. And um, that has been really invaluable to how my practice has developed. And it also gave me a wider insight into the larger industry. So the larger jewelry industry that my practice sits within. And it gave, it educated me a lot about um, kind of the different modes of jewelry production, the value chain in regards to the different things that are part of that, of the supplies that feed into that process. 
um, globally in terms of the countries where gems uh, and uh, minerals and precious metals are mined. And it also opened up connections with jewelry and craft professionals from lots of different parts of the world and gave me access to areas of expertise in my field that I probably would have struggled to access otherwise. Um, so for me, um, my wider engagement gives me this breadth of knowledge about what's happening in jewelry and it allows me to feed that back into my, uh, my, my work. Um, and also because so many of my sales are directly with individuals, I get a lot of feedback from them around the pieces um, and or from the people that they, um, they gift the pieces to. I think a, a good thing for people to do um, in terms of kind of using feedback or letting feedback to some extent inform or guide your decisions going forward is to keep track of kind of which styles and pieces are purchased regularly uh, or frequently and, um, and develop new work in response to that. So this is something that I do. Um, and I also keep track of where the gaps are. So for example, where people have looked for something or they've asked for pieces that I don't have. And I can learn from that and think about how I can develop things within that space that fit into the way that I work. Um, so a lot of the earring styles that, have, that I've developed over the years have come from direct feedback from clients who perhaps purchased one particular style. So they purchased like a hoop earring, but they're interested in a different kind of stud earring for another aspect of their life, or they're looking for a gem to be in, incorporated into um, an earring and maybe I haven't done that before. So it's, it's pushed me into thinking about different ways to design pieces for that. Um, and the other thing I do is I tend to test new ideas and products by making variations and wearing them myself first uh, to see kind of how I feel about it, how it works, how it functions, if it's viable, if there's anything that needs to be adjusted, but also what the response is to it. So if, if I'm wearing something and it's really piqued people's interest and they, I get questions about it or comments about it or people inquire about it, um, then I continue to develop um, kind of that piece or pieces along those lines. And another thing that's really interesting with kind of people using social media, media more frequently is that um, kind of in a way that's a, allowed a different kind of feedback to happen, which is like visual feedback. So that's not necessarily that your pieces are being worn, but that's when people respond to images of your work that you're posting on social media channels. So and this is great because actually it makes it really easy for you to track which pieces have a high engagement with your audience, um, not just in terms of like how many likes or how many saves, but also like which pieces are shared, which of your pieces show up on other people's feeds or are shared on other platforms. Um, and you, there's a variety of kind of analytical tools within those apps and those programs that can help you to like track some of that stuff, but you can also just pay attention to it yourself and note down um, things that you notice. Um, and the thing that's also great about that is you can also keep track of pieces that they aren't just shared or liked or saved, but that when you post something about them, you have quite immediate engagement in terms of people sending you emails or, or sending you messages um, asking, you know, about if they're available or if you, you know, how they can order it or you know, asking questions about those particular pieces. That's usually a pretty uh, good sign that you've got a winner on your hands. <laughs> so in recent years, I've begun to really examine my practice and think about where I want to focus my time and energy. Um, as I mentioned, I've done quite a lot of wider work around uh, my jewelry practice within kind of jewelry and within like kind of the crafts kind of space. Um, but with that reflection, I've reduced, I've started to reduce the breadth of my wider work just down to the key areas where I feel most passionate and that is education and community. So this has allowed me to keep involved, but has uh, prevented me or is attempting to prevent me <laughs> from spreading myself too thin. And um, 
And it's about, at this stage, kind of working to protect and safeguard time for the core of my practice so that I um, can continue to create beautiful sculptural geometric pieces, um, uh, whether it's, you know, in metal alone or incorporating gems. Um, and it, it's just giving about giving me some time to kind of make sure I create enough space to be able to sit down and think about where I want to push um, those pieces and what things I want to explore. Um, so over time, this has seen me limit the amount of teaching I do, and I'm still involved with education, but it's transitioning to more focused, targeted um, teaching um, that's more realistic for me around my time commitments. And, um, and also in terms of like community engagement, it's, it's also about um, kind of affecting change within institutions and programs um, to examine like how individuals from all backgrounds can access um, kind of education to push their practices further. Um, so what this has meant is um, about me becoming more proactive and carving out time to continue to develop new work um, both around both work that's available for direct sale, but also in terms of of kind of honing how the bespoke element of my practice works, um, and I'm making some changes to that in terms of different levels of of that. So some things might be made to order around particular styles, whereas others might be much more like the traditional kind of bespoke commissioning kind of process. Um, and I've saw guidance from others with experience about this, more established makers and others in the industry with experience um, in areas like retail, PR, and curation to help be sounding board so that I have some much needed outside perspective as I um, work towards kind of growing my business and pushing my practice forward. So looking towards the future, I'm revisiting some of um, the larger, more experimental work that I did at university and shortly afterwards, and coming back to these pieces with the knowledge that I've gained over the past decade. And I'm looking to push myself uh, both with my kind of concepts and my ideas, but also with the techniques. In a way, the same way that I did um, at that point, kind of uh, as a student, um, and in my kind of early kind of stages as an emerging maker, but with a bigger knowledge base than I had at that point. Um, and as I said, mentioned earlier, I'm looking, um, I'm learning and looking as to where I need to focus my energy for new work, um, how I want to push myself and my practice forward. Um, and one of the things I'm really working on is I want to have a larger body of work for immediate sale. Um, and um, larger body, but also, like I said, more, more curated around the sculptural qualities and the kind of sculptural forms. Um, and I'm looking to push um, the pieces that I'm going to have for immediate sale into more ambitious territory for me. Um, so that's kind of a big thing. And, um, and I'm also looking at kind of ways for me to be more accessible to buy directly from in terms of different approaches to retail. Um, and I'm looking at that both locally and internationally. And in addition, I'm looking to developing my web presence um, so that I'm featured more consistently across a variety of like online retail platforms as well. So whether that's my own website or whether that's select um, other kind of online uh, retailers. So, kind of the most important lesson for me um, kind of has been in safeguarding the space and time to do new work. So I'm restructuring aspects of my business, uh, my working practice to do that. Um, I'll be continuing the bespoke aspect of my practice, but I'll be contracting how much of a percentage of my business that is. And as much as I enjoy the collaborative nature of designing and making to commission, I need to kind of address that balance um, and I need to redress it so that I have time to work um, and create solely without the constraints of um, kind of the collaborative process or like a basically designing or making to a brief. 
And I realized that if I don't give myself time to be strategic and plan my next steps, that my practice becomes defined on what others want from me in terms of my jewelry and what others want from me as a maker and not necessarily what I want for myself and for my practice and for my business. So I need to make sure that I have time to, um, to be able to envision where I wanna be and that I take the adequate steps um, and work towards getting there. Do you want me to stop sharing the screen or leave it up? Sorry. Uh, yes, please. Okay. <laughs> Just trying to come back here. Um, seems to have disappeared. One second. Thank you so much, Melanie. That was really, really insightful. And it was really wonderful to see um, all the various aspects of your practice and your wider work. And really lovely to see your plans for the future and kind of going back to some of that more kind of larger scale, um, ambitious work, because sometimes the further you get on in your kind of craft career, you kind of move away from those really big yeah, exactly. pieces. Yeah. So that would be really nice to see how that develops. Um, but yeah, I just have a few questions for you, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, firstly, I was just wondering if you have a particular kind of favourite piece that you that you really love. And... <laughs> that's always a hard question. <laughs> It's, it's hard because sometimes you love a piece but actually it's not a bestseller or anything but it, you know regardless of whether other people yeah. react to it do you have something that's kind of quite special that you've made well yeah like I said that's a pretty hard question because I do have a fondness for quite a few of the pieces that I make but I would say that I'm if I had to like put my finger on it or you know I, I'm I'm a rings person I love rings so I guess it would have to be like a ring but having said that, I wanted to highlight something that was a pretty special pair of earrings because um, earrings are next for me after rings. And one of my favorite pieces I don't have here, but I'm going to mention it because it was in the slide. So um, uh, one of my favorite pieces was the lapis earrings that I had in my slides, the lapis and gold earrings that I had early on in my slides. Um, and they were one of my favorite pieces and I finally put them up for sale last year and they sold like right away. So I don't have them anymore. <laughs> I had to say goodbye to them. Um, but they were really special because a lapis was gifted to me um, by this kind of gem cutter um, that was a teacher that I worked with when I was working in Afghanistan. Um, and they'd been in lots of exhibitions, so that was pretty cool. But um, in terms of the rings, coming back to the rings, like as I said, I, I love rings. And if I had to pick a favorite ring, um, it would probably be, and it's funny because it's not necessarily the most like difficult or you know, um, ambitious ring that I've ever done. It's- Oh, beautiful. So it's got, now the thing, the reason why, so I turn it the right way. The reason why this ring um, is quite important is because it's kind of like a ring style that launched a bunch of other ring styles that I, where I work in variations of that way that I'm working. So, and, and it's been like, this is, but this is the original one. This is the first one I did like this with this kind of detailing around it. And like the detailing over the years has like been honed and become like more, and I've, I've kind of gone on to do other variations, which aren't necessarily like the same on the side, but are doing different things in terms of what's happening kind of in the middle. So it's, it, it, it's this one is like the original kind of one. And lots of people have ordered their own variations of this in like different colored gemstones from like kind of peachy, um, uh, uh, what is it? Yeah, peachy topazes, like imperial topazes and different kinds of tourmalines to amethyst to whatever. So it's just like the original one, basically. That's beautiful. Yeah, I can see why it's yeah. popular. And it's, it's nice to see the kind of other forms as well, how it's developed. Yeah. Really and it also just looks great on as well. It does. It looks uh, <laughs> really nice. Um, for all, and I was just going to talk to you a bit about kind of social media, because obviously it's uh, makers are using it. Yeah. Um, and it's a fantastic kind of free marketing tool. Hmm. But kind of making sure that you have the time to do it and not kind of spending too much time on it or too little time. Um, yeah scheduling that I wondered how you organize your kind of marketing so I think that 
the main thing about social media is to be consistent. So, and that's consistent for you. So it's not necessarily like you have to post it this many times a day, or you have to post this many, like, you know, it's more that like, if you have a pattern that you keep up with that pattern so that people kind of, yeah. And, and I think, um, for me, I find Instagram most successful, but I would say don't rule out Facebook because I do do that. And actually like, that's quite helpful. And that's a different sense of connection and community than Instagram is. Um, now for Instagram, there's also kind of differing opinions around whether you should have a separate page for your business or whether you should integrate it um, or, you know, combine. there's kind of pros and co cons for both ways of doing that. I have it integrated, but that's because actually I think people are interested in me because they're not just interested in the work like remove from me they're interested in me as a craftsperson so they kind of want to know a little bit about what's happening in my life I mean I don't bombard them with too many pictures of the vegetables I'm growing in my garden <laughs> but, but you know to some extent like I, there's an insight and kind of to that um so I think like the main thing is to like I said be consistent try and post pe things like regularly keep people updated um it basically just keeps you in the forefront of their minds and what I do is like, I'm gonna, do you want me to talk a little bit about how I plan my posts? Is that helpful? Yeah, I was just kind of thinking it, it must be quite difficult in the yeah, so, to put that time aside, must not it? Yeah, so what I was going to say is that, um, okay, I plan my posts to kind of show my work in a variety of ways. So I plan it to like, you know, I, I might have some photos that will have it on photograph nicely on a white background, you know, from like photo shoots with models more and more informally, just me showing it on the hands. Um, and in particular, works in progress. Um, any insight into like the craft process or the what you're doing or the processes you're using. So obviously I work both with wax and with um, uh, straight fabricating metal. People are really engaged and interested and really welcome like any post to do with that. Um, I think it's good so that they just want to see behind the scenes, but I think it's also good to use the different elements of the different platforms. So have some videos, have some things where they can scroll through different pictures, have some things come in your stories or like, you know, like the various versions of that. So that like, you're kind of like popping up in different places, I would say. Um, and I know they have those scheduling tools um, and they do work for some people, but they're only good if you can keep the immediacy of it. Like it has to feel like organic and like immediate. And I pick two times that I post um, and that covers like one of the times and it's not like really regimented. It's just, I try and fit it into those two slots. One of them works for people in the UK and Europe essentially, and also kind of covers some people in South Asia or Africa or, uh, and then the other um, time slot works for like North America to some extent. So I don't like cover tons of time slots, but those are, those are basically where the main bits of my audience are. Um, so that's really helpful. And I think, I mean, other people post at other times and there's basically there's tools that you can look at to see the main times your audience are on. So that's where I've decided to pick that. And a little tri trick for, I tend to try and post like either at lunchtime like I plan my posts at lunchtime and I post in the afternoon or I plan my posts just after work or around dinner and then post after dinner so it's kind of fits into my day I don't like have to worry about it but one thing that's good that can help speed up the process is you can gather the images like so I gather the images like over a period of time and have them in my camera roll ready and I put the post I put the writing I want to do in my notes so that it's, I don't have to think about it. At the, like when I want to do my posts, like I can then like put it, put it together. I don't have to sit there thinking, what am I going to say? And like, you know, what pictures am I going to use? So, yeah. That's really good actually. Yeah. Cause I think people can just kind of take, take hours and hours. Coming. Yeah. And it just helps speed up. And you just also, you just don't get too anxious because you've like got bits of it there. And then the last thing is obviously hashtags are important. So but you can get ideas about hashtags by following other people that are in a similar space as you or like areas that relate to what you're doing and see the hashtags that people are using. So you don't have to worry about like trying to figure out what hashtags are 
definitely it's such a minefield now isn't it I think <laughs> and it's very kind of saturated so it's getting yeah, kind of harder and harder but... and I think it had like you you can't like you can't worry about it too much you just have to do what works for you and what you feel comfortable with yeah like, so and I think as well um kind of as you say you kind of integrate your kind of personal one and your business one actually what might make something more unique is that kind of more personality coming through and that integration yeah. and just kind of finish. And actually like somebody told me because I thought that that was like, I had heard different things and someone was saying that that wasn't as professional and you should have your business page, but actually like someone who does a lot of work in that area, like in terms of like PR and stuff said a lot of people who streamlined and made these really beautiful business pages that look perfect have started going the other way around and like, opened up their personal pages because people felt like they didn't know the person behind the, the yeah. brand or behind whatever so I always think that's a you know good thing to give people a little bit you know because most people that are buying independently or from craft people they're interested in you it's not like the same as buying from a big company definitely and like you say showing all of the kind of elements of the making process your studio yeah. because people you know you kind of forget people don't understand that unless they're in your particular field and if they're buying yeah. things from you they're, they're probably not and and they just want to see that you at work and all the different elements and it's been cool because it's opened up some really cool conversations like not in terms of sales but in terms of other makers where they've been like you know i've gotten to know makers because of that and like so i it's built for me that community of people that i haven't met in person but i've only met online because i posted something and they're like oh i do that too and then they end up chatting about like our techniques or like the tools we're using or like where we got this or where we got that which is kind of cool yeah because your materials and techniques are also unique for every single yeah. maker so yeah. that's really lovely actually yeah. um so i'll just <laughs> move on um i was this is quite a big one actually obviously this last year has kind of forced mm -hmm. a lot of um changes for everybody but in terms of kind of designers and makers um galleries haven't been open a lot of the selling platforms haven't been there shops makers markets you know and everyone's kind of had to change yeah. um, I wondered how you've kind of adapted and what things you're going to be kind of keeping uh, going forward if, if you've had to make changes yeah I mean it was pretty scary I'm not gonna <laughs> not just the pandemic thing but just as somebody independent it was yeah. you know I had something boxed up that I was literally about to post oh out and I called and I was like ah and they were like yeah we're not gonna we're pretty sure we're not gonna be opening and then they haven't been open like since so um but but actually even though it, there have been changes there's been some positives to it um and one thing it's allowed me to do is to work well a to be more become more engaged with my audience yeah. um and also to work more directly with people so one thing that I think it's done is it's broken down to some extent um, some barriers around uh, barriers around people's perceptions around doing things remotely. Um, people have become much more open to ordering jewelry over the internet and also to planning commissions remotely. And also there's a whole element of the bespoke that like people think is really out of like out of reach or out of touch or like they're like, oh, that's something I'm a bit afraid of. And it's people have become more adventurous about inquiring about getting something bespoke made and it's it's almost democratized to some extent elements of that process, which I think has been really good because people who I don't think would have asked me about it before because they were like unsure about the cost involved have gotten in touch and it's opened up some really interesting conversations. Um, so it's made me kind of shift I've become more agile um, i've had to adapt. But like I said, ultimately, it's brought me closer to the people that are wearing and buying my jewelry, which is actually quite a good thing. Um, okay. There's been some challenges around like lead times, like access and supplies, production, like elements of production. Um, but even that has had its benefits. Like there's been less pressure to like have faster deadlines. You know, people are more open to like longer things taking longer. They understand about the process more. You're not put under as much pressure sometimes, depending on the person. Um, and also, I've met kind of well. I've connected with new suppliers for materials and for things because like I couldn't access some of the ones I normally would. And I've made some really great connections. It's some really great, interesting material to some new um, people that are sourcing 
ethically and responsibly that I didn't know about that through the networks that have developed. Um, basically, because a lot of like the kind of kind of meetings and conferences and networks around these things have moved online. So I found out about other things that I didn't know about. Um, and also the one thing I think the other thing is that because it was the first time, like in the beginning, the first lockdown, like that was the first time that I wasn't in my studio because it all happened so quickly and the, this building shut down. Wow. That was the first time I wasn't in my studio for that solid amount of time. Like I didn't have access to stuff. And so that made me really value my time in the studio. I've become much more efficient at how I use my studio time. Like, so for example, in the past, I might've been in the studio, but then I would end up doing like not studio based stuff, like admin stuff, like at my desk while at a studio or like other things. Now I'm really safeguarding my time in the studio because I didn't have access to it. So I've like, I make sure that I don't book in certain things when I'm in the studio. So yeah, that's been really good because it's kind of in a way protected an element of my practice in a way that it was getting chipped away kind of without me realizing it. Definitely, because you do, as you were saying, you do have yeah. so many other kind of elements that it's nice to kind of really value that that time. And I think people now are going to really value, you know, going to yeah. galleries and seeing work um, a lot more than than before when they kind of took, took it for granted. But it's lovely that it's also shifted so that um, people's buying habits have changed and like you say, the bespoke element and that kind of thing has opened up a lot more. Yeah. Um, so yeah, some, some good things, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and I won't bore you for too much longer, but I've just got one last question. Yeah. Um, because this will be going to emerging uh, makers in the first instance, mm -hmm. I just wondered if you had one kind of um, top tip or golden nugget that you could mm -hmm. kind of advise people for the beginning of their, their kind of journeys. The main one is to stick with it basically. So there's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be times where you're like, you know, where things are challenging. Um, but you've got to have faith in your work at the end of the day. Um, for me, obviously, as you have heard in the talk, like I've done wider industry work to support my practice. And at times I've taken other part time on other part time work um, that I could fit around like evenings or weekends or whatever, uh, that when I needed to. Um, but the work was a the, the practice, the jewelry practice was the constant. And I always kept at it in some form or another, even if I had to reduce the time that I spent on it because of, for whatever reasons, I didn't stop. And so those, those kinds of varied income streams, like kind of, and other work, um, enabled me to stay true to my practice and um, kind of stay focused on how I wanted to develop it. It, it provided some support. It allowed me to expand my practice because I didn't have some of the pressures I might have had otherwise. But, but I kept showing up for it. I kept showing up for my craft. I didn't stop it. I didn't sideline it. Like even when I was doing teaching work, it wasn't like I was doing, like there's only one period of time, I think, where I took on a role that was like three days a week. That was once. And I was like miserable. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I just tried to do it so that I could fit it around it. And I think the main thing is that you you have to, you can't think about it as a hobby or a side business. You have to make it the core of what you're doing. And obviously, you know, we all have different situations. Most of us are gonna have to do different kinds of work around it and definitely in the start. Um, but um, if you need, you know, to support yourself or if you have family commitments or whatever, I mean, we're all realistic, but you've got to keep your craft practice at the center you've got to you've got to really keep it there and you you just gotta just gotta stick with it gotta prioritize it um you gotta stay connected in with that whole space and industry you can't just kind of kind of put yourself off you know cut your cut yourself off from it you've got to stay with it stick with it stay engaged stay involved that's kind of the main thing that's that's perfect isn't it that's just the main advice really yeah. it's so easy for people because like you say there are so many outside elements and it might be a lot of makers do have part-time work yeah and sometimes you know the offer of that stable income coming in mm. can kind of creep up or you might get offered more yeah. and want to push this to the side or have a family and it, it is difficult but yeah if you can just remember to even if it's you know, just a bit of studio. Exactly, even if it's just a little bit, like 
there's been times where I didn't have like specific things I was working on. Like I didn't have specific pieces I was developing or I didn't have a commission or order. And I just made something, anything, just, you know? <laughs> so like people have got some random gifts. <laughs> I've got some random pieces that don't have necessarily anything to do specifically with other elements of what I'm doing, but it's just, you've got to keep your hand in it. You've got to keep it going. Yeah. And if you're just making it full of joy and to give to people, exactly. that's really lovely, isn't it? That's actually kind of nicer in a way than. Yeah. Um, and it's good sometimes you need that actually, because it just, there's no pressure. It's no, like you're not doing it to fulfill anything. You're just, just doing the stuff that you love doing. And sometimes it's nice to do that. It is. Uh, yeah. And as you, as you move on, you kind of, again, you might lose that a bit because you're making things to order, but exactly. it's nice to touch, touch in with that. Oh, yeah. thank you so much, Melanie. I won't grill you anymore. I've kept you for a while. <laughs> um, but that was really, really fantastic. And uh, exactly. yeah, I think that will be really so wonderful for people to, and, and inspiring for people, uh, makers at the beginning. So um, I'll stop recording now and um, say goodbye. And thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.